everybody, my name is Phil Strazula. I'm the founder of a website called Select Software Reviews. And today we're gonna to do a quick overview on buying HR tech. This is meant to be for people who already are actually fairly experienced at buying HR tech and providing a couple of unique insights, as well as folks who maybe are just getting started. Maybe you've gone through one or two procurement processes. Maybe this is your first one ever. Um, thanks to the folks at Recruiting News Network for asking us to do this. As a quick background, I originally started my career off working in venture capital, investing into software companies, went to business school, taught myself how to program, started an HR tech business. And then about two years ago, I started Select Software as a website to be the place that HR and TA professionals go to learn about how to buy software, who are the best vendors in a given space, and generally be more successful when buying the tools necessary to grow their organizations. So this is gonna be a quick overview of the HR tech buying process full of practical pro tips that you can implement and hopefully you'll learn something. So first off, we gotta start with what to buy. You might be looking at this video because you're like, I need new ATS. If you're sort of mapping out the universe within your organization, here's some of the frameworks that I use to understand where should we focus because there are hundreds and, and thousands of different places that we can focus our attention. So the first is this dollar sign, which represents where does the business focus right now? So if you talk to the functional leaders in sales and product and engineering, et cetera, what are the problems that they're dealing with and how can HR and TA help with that? For example, maybe you talk to head of customer success, we've got a churn issue, let's focus on employee engagement, let's focus on rewards and recognition. Maybe you go to the sales team, hey, we can't hire fast enough, let's focus on sourcing. Let's focus on automation to decrease time to fill, et cetera. The employee life cycle, um, apologies on the graphics, by the way, I'm not a very good artist. <laughs> uh, so let's map out the entire journey from the first time somebody touches our employer brand all the way through alumni. Where are the breaking points? Where are people falling out of our hiring funnel? Why are they leaving early? Where are they not getting promoted? Is it internal mobility? Is it an LMS that we need to invest in, et cetera? If you map out the entire employee journey, all the hundreds of different touch points, you're gonna say, oh wow, this is really weak, this is really weak, et cetera. The last framework here is your gut. You live and breathe this stuff all day long. You talk to the functional leaders, you talk to your recruiters, you are just in this organization. And chances are that your subconscious mind is actually telling you to focus in specific areas that are correct. So that's kind of how I think about where to focus your time and energy, your resources, your money, if you don't already know that you need a new LMS, you need a new ATS, you're looking at AI, et cetera. Um, ROI, this is always where I start personally, building an ROI uh, model in Excel that the CFO would appreciate that at the end of the day has dollars and cents. There is an entire section on our website that has lots of Excel spreadsheets and lots of videos that walk through those Excel spreadsheets. But just to give you a sense for maybe what one of these would look like, and I don't expect you to follow along with the math here, but let's say we're gonna invest in a new career website. That's amazing. We get to share off, show our culture. Uh, it's gonna look really good, be mobile optimized, et cetera. But what the CFO cares about and what we should care about as business leaders is the dollars and cents ROI. So for example, let's say we get a thousand people to our career site right now, 5% of those apply into the ATS, and we have a 100 to one higher ratio. Let's say that with a new career website, <clears throat> we're gonna increase that conversion rate of visitor to applicant from 5% to 10%. And so we're gonna get another 5% of applicants and we can sort of do the math on how that incremental 5% turns into hires, multiply that by our cost per hire and say, hey, we saved a ton of money on sourcing tech, on programmatic, on new recruiters, et cetera, through this career website. Isn't that amazing? The really cool thing, and we'll get to this in a second with some of the pro tips of the actual buying cycle, is that you can go back to your ROI model six months after implementation and say, hey, it was actually 8%. It was actually 12%. This other assumption, we thought we'd have the same traffic, it actually went up by 10%. So you get to learn by almost reviewing this as a journal entry and understand where you were right, where you were wrong, makes you a better allocator of capital, makes you a more credible leader internally. Okay, so let, let's think about the actual buying process. I've got a nice funnel on my shirt. What we do is we just spend all day working this funnel, understanding who are the thousands of vendors out there, who are the ones that are pretty good, who are the ones that are the best, and let's recommend those to our readers. 
Um, so let's say we're looking at a new applicant tracking system. You know, there's probably like 200 vendors out there, something like that. And we can do our research at the top of funnel. Um, we can look at the best of lists, like on a website like Select Software. We can look at, you know, your G2s, your Capteras, et cetera. Um, a lot of these websites, they're kind of game systems, to be quite honest. Um, a lot of them are sort of pay to play as well. That's why we started our, our site in the first place. Um, but we can start to sort of narrow down. We'll see some common names here. Um, we can go on LinkedIn and we can look at the company headcount. If you've got a premium LinkedIn account, you're gonna see a nice little chart that shows the um, employee count over time. Sometimes we see charts that look like this for employee count. That's not a good sign. And you'd be surprised by how many vendors you can eliminate that way. You can look at Glassdoor reviews, et cetera. Um, you can also look at things like the website's domain authority on something like Ahrefs um, to kind of understand like how big is this company, how credible are they, things like that. Um, the next is we're gonna do demos. We recommend doing demos um, with three to seven vendors, depending on how comprehensive a process you are going to run. You wanna stay organized here. Um, we recommend building out a spreadsheet that on the um, column side has um, all of the vendors. So vendor one, two, three, four, and then you've got your need to have criteria. Hey, we need to have an HRIS integration. We need to have SSO. And then you've got your nice to have stuff. Hey, we'd, we'd really love it if this had analytics that were more than just your standard analytics, or we'd really love it if this also had some sort of integration with our sourcing technology, et cetera. Um, and then you've, you've got stuff, stuff down here like price and pricing model. Um, some companies charge, some vendors charge based on number of seats, number of users, number of hires. How is this going to change your price in the future? We also um, actually think it's really important to think about rep likability. How much do you like your salesperson? Um, this is kind of weird, but good salespeople can work anywhere and they work at companies with really great products because that allows them to hit quota. And so if you like your sales rep, it's actually a really good sign um, that the product itself will be strong as well. A pro tip that I actually forgot to sneak in here, when you reach out for demos, you're gonna get, <clears throat> you go to the vendor website, fill out the form, they send you an email, they're like, hey, can we set up a time to talk? Um, they want to understand, do you have what's called BANT, uh, which is budget, authority, need, and timeline. If you don't have that, they don't want to waste their senior salesperson's time with you. And so they're going to set up this conversation. You can circumvent those conversations a lot of times to save yourself time um, and also move the process along quicker by literally responding, being like, hey, I've got BANT, I'm the decision maker. We've already set aside a uh, budget for this. We're, we want it for X, Y, Z reason, and we're gonna do it next quarter. Um, or you can just get on these phone calls and make them 10 minutes by understanding exactly what they're looking for and honestly making it fairly transactional. Okay, so you've done all this. Um, you've, you've kept really good notes throughout this process. You know, you get your spreadsheet, et cetera. By the way, massive, massive pro tip. After you do a demo, so let's say you did a demo with vendor number one, send them the spreadsheet, blank all this stuff out in a box and be like, hey, just wanna double check that this is correct. A lot of times the vendors will see, oh, they're looking at vendor number two, three, four. Do we give them the most competitive price? Uh, and many times you'll actually see the price go down a significant amount if you're just showing, hey, I'm a sophisticated buyer, I'm doing my research and I'm talking to your competitors as well. Um, okay, so you've done all this stuff, you're gonna make a decision, uh, you're gonna negotiate on price, looking at you know implementation fees as sort of like key things that you can target to take out of the contract, and then of course the implementation. I don't wanna make this video too long, but the last thing, again, that I'll say that I think is really, really powerful is six months, 12 months, 18 months after implementation, go back to this ROI model and Take a look at what assumptions were right, what assumptions were wrong, and analyze them for your own personal self, your own personal growth, but also then evangelize within the organization 
what you did because there's this really amazing virtuous circle that happens where if you do a good job and you evangelize it, you get internal credibility, which gets you more resources, which allows you to get more tools, which allows you to do a better job, which if you then evangelize on and on and on, gets you more resources, gets you more internal credibility, et cetera. And so there's this like amazing virtuous feedback cycle that starts happening here and goes here and goes here and then enables the people team to get the internal street cred that they deserve. So Phil Strizzle from Select Software Reviews. Hopefully that was an interesting overview that gave you a couple of pro tips you hadn't heard of before. Again, we've got tons of stuff on the website. We'll try to link to a bunch of the things below as well that are useful resources. Good luck in your procurement process and uh, let us know how it goes.